Good evening and welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. I'm Joan Jasper and I'm with the Department of Exhibitions and Public Programs here at the library. And thank you so much for coming to our program tonight with author Craig Childs. And we want to thank Craig for coming tonight. He's been jet setting all around the country promoting his new book, The House of Rain. And we also want to thank Little Brown Publishers for bringing Craig to us. And also want to thank Book Bay at the Main who is selling Craig's book and Craig will be happy to autograph copies and have more informal conversation with you at the book table at the end of the program. Craig Childs is a commentator for National Public Radio's Morning Edition. He has written for the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and several magazines. His work has won the Spirit of the West Award as well as the Colorado Book Award. And the, the book House of Rain is Craig's latest book. So please help me wait, welcome Craig Childs. Hello. I come to you from out of the desert. I'm coming to you from, from a landscape where once you get an eye for things, three grains of sand out of place draw your attention, where everything is brought to bear, where everything is hinged to a story, every wind that comes through, every drop of rain leaving a dimple in the ground. Stories are everywhere out in this landscape. When you walk down into the bottom of the narrow canyons made of sandstone, and you put your hands on the sandstone faces as you walk along the smooth, scoured scallops that look like champagne glasses cut back into the rock walls, you can feel the shape of the last flood that came through. Every place in the desert is a story. Every place is a passageway. It's really hard to walk very far in the desert for me because there are so many stories that start opening up, that start leading you from place to place to place. And, and soon you, you start to pick up the, the patterns of water, the patterns of wind, of rain. You, you pick up the patterns of people who've been there before you because out there, Things seem to last forever. If you put a footprint down in certain places, that footprint will stay for five years, maybe even 10 years to somebody who's got a really good eye where you come walking along and you see just the slightest depression in the ground and you kneel at it and you figure out that it was a person with about size nine foot walking across the desert eight years before you. Everything out there tells a story. That's why I'm here, because I'm looking for stories. I'm looking for these same kinds of stories that I find in the desert. I came to hear straight from Grace Cathedral today, where I walked into the cathedral, and I took off my shoes and walked on the, the maze that's right in the front, in the center. And I don't know if you've ever been to this place. You'd have to stop in and walk this maze because it is very much like what it's like to be out in the desert, where you start walking along and you see where, where you're going eventually. You see the, the center spot and you know where you're going to be except you're going away from it and then toward it and then away from it and all the way around it and then away from it again and back toward it. That's what it's like walking out in the desert when you're in the deep cliffs, when you're out in the dunes where you know you want to get over there but there's not a route from here to there. I mean, if you had a GPS out there, it wouldn't really work because it would point an arrow straight to where you want to be and there's a cliff face between you and it. And to get there, you've got to turn around and go that way. To get down, you've got to go up on a series of ledges. To go up, you've got to go down into a narrow canyon where there's a big choked boulder jammed into the bottom. Every place has this backward trail, this labyrinth leading you around. And I was walking around this maze for about an hour before coming here. And it does the same kind of thing where your mind settles where you have to pay attention to where you're going. Because if you look up for too long at all the passing architecture, you'll forget where you are on the maze. You'll end up in the wrong spot. You'll end up going the wrong direction. 
and you won't be able to find your way to the center. Of course, out in the desert, you can't just walk off of the maze and out the front door and back onto the street. Out in the desert, you are there. The cliffs stand around you. The mazes are everywhere, passages opening up left and right. To write this book, House of Rain, um, I walked a little bit over a thousand miles in legs from the Four Corners region where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado meet down to the Sierra Madre on the Chihuahua Sonora border in Mexico. And some of, these, some of these treks took me across deep desert and took me across wilderness. Some of these treks took me through excavations where I worked with archaeologists. There was one excavation along the way, I remember, uh, out in the desert near Winslow, Arizona. And the desert out there is just this still life with just a few landmarks on the horizon. And it is just this, this empty hole, the little Colorado River desert, the painted desert. And we were working on a 500-room Pueblo dating back to about, uh, um, about 1400 AD. And I just remember the wind just hailing down on us for days. And you'd be working down with, with trowels inside of a trench. And if you stopped for too long, the sand would start to fill up your hole again because it was blowing so much. And everybody was turned away from the wind. So it looked like, like some kind of religious thing was going on here. All these people bowed to the ground for days and days, tinkering with some unimaginable smallness in front of them, while the wind just pushed harder and harder, sand blasting across you, filling up all the rooms that you just emptied out, as if the desert is rolling back over itself. Because even where trails are left, trails disappear out there. Nothing stays for too long. Even the footprints that last for seven years eventually disappear. I found something out there that I'd like to read to you. It was, um, it, it, it was a site, that, an archaeological site on the Colorado Plateau that I ran into a number of years ago. And I've gone down to it uh, a couple of times now. When I, when I first found it, um, I had been on the river for seven days in a canoe. And I tied off and broke through the, the tamarisk, which if you've ever been down on those r desert rivers, the tamarisk, the, the invasive species of plant that, that runs along the shoreline. It just makes this, this jungle, this dry, hard jungle that you, you just work your way through until you've got sticks stabbed into your ears and hair. And, and tammy spuds is what we call it. It's the stuff that rains down off of these trees, and it just fills up the back of your shirt. I came through the tamarisk up to a, a flat area, and a cliff was there. And I saw a piece of pottery on the ground, a broken piece of pottery. And you see, if you start looking around, you see little tracks like this. You see pieces of broken pottery that date back 800 years, 900, 1,200 years. And I dropped down onto my hands and knees when I saw that one. And I started brushing around in the sand until I could feel others. And I just blew the sand away. And I could see the rim of a broken pot in the ground. And once I saw that, my eyesight was much sharper, and I began to pick out details all around me. I could see where there used to be a, a dwelling of some sort, and I, I could see that, that there was a, a little crop field over here, and I could see a, a very small community, a, a family of maybe 12 had lived here. And when I looked up into the cliff, I saw stacks of rock behind a little spall of cliff that was stuck out, and I realized there was a granary up there. I immediately started for it, climbing hand over hand up the cliff base, feeling an anxious press of revelation as I ascended ledges and cracks. My breath tasted hot with discovery. I had found a secret. In past travels, I had seen many granaries belonging to the Anasazi, but they had all been broken open, emptied by archaeologists, by pot hunters, by erosion, or even, perhaps, by the residents themselves, returning many centuries later. 
This one had been built so that no stranger would see it, like an attic accessed through a hidden door. I entered a gap behind a shadowed rock flake, and there I knelt be beside the structure. It was rectangular, like a cupboard. I touched its face with probing diagnostic fingers, measuring it with my eyes, three feet tall, two feet wide, and three feet deep. I got up on my haunches and lightly dusted off the granary's flat roof, which was undamaged. I licked my lips, feeling their dry chap. For some thousand years, not a single breeze had entered the space within this chamber, not an inkling of light. Residents living below had cached something that to this day had remained untouched. My imagination raced. What tightly woven baskets were here? What painted ceramics? What woven textiles? What stockpile of cobalt blue and honey-colored seed corn left many centuries before the boom of Spanish rifles? With a finger, I traced through the dust and fallen rock debris on the granary's roof where I outlined a rectangular hatch the way in. I blew off dust, revealing a piece of flagstone mortared into place, used to seal the granary shut. When I'm out there looking for stories and routes and trails, I find things like this. I've so far come upon three baskets in the desert and three different whole ceramic vessels that people had put underneath ledges. And these are things that I, I don't dig for. I just look in cracks and crannies to see what's left behind. You find pieces of, of sandals or sometimes whole sandals. You find little bits of people, signs that, that in this desert, there were people everywhere. And they aren't always small like that. They aren't always a ceramic vessel underneath a ledge. Sometimes they're huge. Sometimes they're three-story dwellings that are built up into the cracks. There, there are buildings that they, they made in the 11th century AD that the Anasazi, the Pueblo people made, that have single foundations that are three acres, the size of the base of the Sears Tower that were five stories tall. They built roads out in this landscape. They built at least 400 miles of, of roads are documented in the Four Corners area. And when, I, when I'm saying roads, I'm saying swaths cut across the desert that are 30 feet wide, that have berms about this high on both sides and run absolutely straight. And if they hit a landmark of some sort, they don't go around it. They go up and over it, or they go down a cliff. And when you're on one of these roads and you get to the edge of a cliff, you can see that it's easier to go down maybe 20 feet over to your left. But they go right down the cliff, and you look down the cliff, and there are stairs carved into the cliff face so that this road stays absolutely straight. My take on this is that out in the desert, the ultimate commodity besides water is visibility. And if you set a line across the desert, you're going to see it from everywhere. Every butte top, you're look, going to look down on this desert and see these bold lines cutting across the desert. And you'll know that line goes somewhere. You get on it, you follow it, and it leads you to one of these, they're known as great houses, these, these structures that are up to three acres in size. And these great houses are often aligned in a certain way so that at certain times of the year, say summer solstice, light comes through portals and windows and makes alignments within the buildings. I've sat in many of these buildings at different times of the year, excavated sites where the walls are still standing, and just watched this, this, this light show start at sunrise, where lights start appearing on the walls all around me. And, and you realize this is how you tell time out in this landscape. This is, this is the way they did calendars. This is the way they, they understood the larger sphere, the moving of the heavens, was by setting up structures that could receive the light in certain ways. I mean, it's, it's happening everywhere. I was just in Salt Lake City, and I took a walk downtown, and I saw a pillar that's, that had been built in the last four years, and it had a big block of sandstone that I recognized. It was probably Wingate sandstone that had been hauled up there from, from about 200, 250 miles away. But I noticed in the pillar there was a, a, a gap at the bottom. 
And I walked up and I looked through the gap and I saw that there were some posts in the distance. And then I looked around and there was a circle around the gap and there were zodiacal signs around it. And then each post had a prism in it so that light going through the crack would hit the prism and that light would go to another prism and you would be able to, to tell the time of year by this object that was built in the last four years. And I, am, I saw this and I thought, what would archaeologists think if they encountered this? They would look at this and say, what civilization was this? What religion drove them to do this? We keep doing the same things over and over again. Many researchers um, believe these archaeoastronomical sites are, are very specifically designed, whereas other researchers are saying it's all coincidence. But not long ago, I was up at a place called Chimney Rock in southwest Colorado. And it's over 8,000 feet. And you're up at the southern end of the Rocky Mountains. And there's this scarp of rock that, that rises up probably about 1,000 feet out of a valley floor. And right at the tip of this scarp, there are two twin towers of rock. And if you get to a certain place on top of this, this very narrow butte, you can see between those two towers. And there happens to be one of these great houses built up on top of this scarp that looks right through that gap. And it just happens that every 18.6 years, when the major lunar standstill cycle starts and the moon goes into its northernmost point on the horizon, it rises right in between those towers. And I was there for the last, the beginning of the 18.6 year cycle. And we stood up there, probably 20 of us, researchers, Forest Service people, all gathered up in the same spot with, with cameras and huddled and, you know, it was, it was late December at 8,000 feet. And we were all watching this gap and somebody had done very intricate work to figure out exactly where you need to stand to see the light at exactly the right time. And as we were all gathered up there, I remember this, this older archaeoastronomer said, it's too bad that this isn't celebrated anymore. This is such a momentous occasion, the, the moon finally coming up through the gap, and nobody celebrates it. And I just looked at him as we were all bundled together, and I just thought, have you not noticed? All of us here, pressed to the edge, watching this one gap just to see a breach of light come through the spot. If this isn't celebrating this moment, I don't know what is. A bunch of researchers coming from all over the country, in fact, all over the world for this event. This is probably what happened a thousand years ago. I imagined a man very much like the one who had figured out that where we needed to stand at what time, or perhaps it was a woman. It was somebody who came up and, and checked this site every day until he sent out the word saying, okay, on this particular day, you can put on your feathers and everybody get your stuff. We're going up and it's gonna happen because as before the moon was rising, I could see he was nervous. He was pacing back and forth because he wasn't sure if he was exactly right. He had used spherical trigonometry to figure out when and where to be at what, you know, just to see that moment. And he was pacing back and forth and I could see he was going through his numbers going, okay, uh, a lot of people came for this. Am I right about this? And I saw somebody a thousand years ago pacing up here and looking over at these fierce looking Mayan dudes who came 2,000 miles for this event and were wearing, wearing parrot feathers and seeing people who'd come out of Chaco in northern New Mexico, everybody gathered there. And you know it was the moment because the great house that was built there, the tree rings taken out of it, show that it was constructed every 18.6 years. So whenever the moon came through the gap, they did massive construction for it. So you know that was the time, and you know there was somebody pacing up there just checking whatever watch he had, looking at that gap, and thinking, I hope this is the day. And it was the day. We stood there and waited, and he said, first light. We all looked, and we couldn't see it. He had better eye. He had been watching this much longer than us. But then we just started to see the glow. And then the orb of the moon rose into this narrow gap between two twin towers looking north into the Rocky Mountains. And as that happened, I turned around and I looked south. And I could see out of the Rocky Mountains, I could see a gap 
where the Piedra River flows south. And through that gap, I could see the desert of northern New Mexico. And just over the horizon, just about 120 miles away, is Chaco Canyon, the largest Anasazi site in the southwest, just over the horizon. And in between these towers and Chaco Canyon, there are fire signal stations up on top of buttes. Every fire signal station is within view of two other signal stations. Each of those, four, on and on and on, so that a fire would be lit at one spot and everybody would know. You could send messages for hundreds of miles. You could send messages over mountain ranges. There are fire signals all over the Four Corners, roads and fire signals. I, I talked to the guy who first discovered these, these signals, and he, he was just out there mapping archaeological sites with a crew in the 70s, and he kept coming upon these hills that had some kind of had a little bit of architecture, but they couldn't tell what they were, and they decided they're just not going to put them in the, in the reports because they didn't have a name for these, until he decided to go up to one, and he dug into it, and there he found a, stone, a carved stone bowl with a carved stone lid and set into it, and he opened it up, and it was full of pieces of turquoise, and that's when he looked around, and he thought, wait a minute, there's something going on here, and then he started mapping them all. He started marking them all on his map until he realized these are all visual relays. There's a, a network, a communication network of some sort. Or maybe it was when the moon breached the gap, they lit the fire, so the signal went out. So everybody across the Colorado Plateau would know the needle has been threaded. And I imagine that day, People in Chaco Canyon, all standing there, facing north, looking at a fire tower that would have delivered a message down into the canyon. I imagine people all over the four corners, all facing the di same direction at the same moment. Maybe this didn't happen. Everything is conjecture out there, but you know something was going on. How much do you want to know? When I saw that granary up in the cliff, I wanted to know what was inside of it. I thought I could easily break the seal around this stone. I had a good knife with me. It would be very easy to cut a square around it and just pop that stone out. And I would see what's inside of a granary, what these people left behind. It was something for their survival, something that they could return to, something very important. I, you know, I've, I've spent years going through m museum collections and opening up drawers in the basement of, of the Peabody in the American Museum of Natural History in New York where, where, you're, just, where you're just pulling out drawers and looking into to masses of artifacts, the, the incredible striking black on white pottery of the Anasazi. What, what is in this place? But the granary was not mine to open. It was left by other people, a stockpile waiting for their return. As I understand more of the Anasazi, it is hard to say that they ever truly vanished. The farther I track them, the more it seems they are right in front of me until I can nearly feel body heat left in their footsteps. It is not unthinkable that a person might someday return to this granary, maybe a century from now or a millennia relieved to find an intact sign of ancestry deep in this river gorge. I climbed down to the granary and laid my hands on its doorstone, feeling the grit of blown sand, the hardness of rock. I did not want to move from here. A person to be found in a thousand years, a statue kneeling at the brink of decision. I withdrew and climbed back to the ground, leaving the granary sealed as I started back toward my canoe, the obsidian night closing around me. At the river, I untied the canoe's bow line, stepped in, and swept the paddle into the water, setting a wake across a mirror of stars. I'd like to show you some images. From this place. This place being the southwest, where I have spent my entire life. I don't know how far I've walked out there. I don't know how many pairs of boots that I've gone through where 
I've taken needles and dental floss and sewed the leather back together. I don't know how long I've been walking out there. And miles don't matter. Days don't matter. It all adds up into this, into movement, into walking through the labyrinth that's opened up into the ground. Finding places, places to camp behind cliffs that have fallen, finding sanctuary, places where the wind won't touch you, places that are eroded out of the earth like bones. Everything is revealed in the desert. There are no questions out there. There's just ground, solid ground, opened layer after layer after layer. And some people come back from, say, the edge of the Grand Canyon, and they say that it makes them feel small. And I understand that, but I think it may be, be, it may be a, a misconception. It may be that it, it's not a landscape that makes you feel small. It's a man landscape that gets rid of your sense of scale entirely because there have been so many times out there in the deep of winter, camping for week after week in the open desert, where at night it gets down to 10 below or 15 below zero, and the, there's nothing in your life but the sky and the stars. And you're looking up into the scar, sky and you think, I could just stand and walk into stars. I could become a giant. There are times in the desert when you're not small, but you are infinite. You take up everything. There is no boundary between you and it. When I look at the, the artifacts, that the, the Anasazi made, the, 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 especially the painted black and whites. I see that landscape. I see the Colorado Plateau. This bowl is uh, from American Museum of Natural History, and that's where it is now. That's the, the storage place. But where it was from before is Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, where there were certain rooms that were filled to the ceiling with bowls stacked inside of each other, bowls like this. And all of their designs, you, you can kind of get a, a glimpse around, around this one of other vessels. They all have this, this stark, sharp nature to them, this, this repeating symmetry, just blending flawlessly all the way around. It looks like that place. It looks like that landscape. I look into this, and I see the sharp edges of the land. I see the way the earth is shaped out there. I see the routes in their vessels. I mean, I, to, to understand these, this one came out of a, a 13th century site in southwest Colorado. And, and I, would, I would sit with these bowls for hours and hours, drawing them into my sketchbook, because that was the only way I could really understand the complexity of of how they got their symmetries to match up because I could never get them to match up in my drawings. I could never do a 100% accurate rendition of these because every line was meaningful. Every line meant something about how you paint the next line, which is what it's like walking out there, looking for those shapes, looking for water, looking for springs, looking for places where the rain has fallen. It's all the same story out there. This is a 13th century or a 14th century polychrome vessel from below the Muggy on Rim in central Arizona. And this is 100 years after the Anasazi supposedly disappeared. There's that, that story about one day this whole civilization just vanished. But if you start following the civilization, you can find where it went. You can find this culture's movement across the land. These are these images inside this bowl came from vessels that were Anasazi. And you can track the movement of styles across the Southwest, across centuries. And I look into these and I, and I see people from the high desert living down in the pines of central Arizona. I see the shapes of their lives still recorded, that the Anasazi didn't disappear. They just moved, and they carried everything with them. And when they ran into other cultures, they adjusted. They changed the color of their vessels. But they kept these same images, images that reflect a landscape that is worn open 
that is, that is controlled by basic elements, by wind, by water, by gravity. I see the shape of the world where I have spent my life, where I have been walking, looking for these stories. And just to give you a sense of scale here, that's me at the bottom of that pillar. And that pillar is just some old wall, and that's all that's left of it, some memory of a canyon. Every place out there is the memory, the memory of water, the memory of humans. Most of those vessels that I just showed you, or they all came from museums. Here, here's one that, that uh, I found a, a few years ago, a seed jar in Utah underneath a ledge. And I didn't move it from this spot. In fact, uh, the sand has just been barely swept away to show the face of it. But it's still there. It's still under that ledge. I hope. I'd like to take you on a route and show you a way down to one of these artifacts. Now, a, a lot of people look across Canyonlands, say in southeast Utah, where this picture is, um, and, and, and it's not always clear how you get around, how you get from place to place. But if you know this place well enough, you know that right over this lip of white sandstone, if you go right over the edge and hang your foot down the other side, you can't see it, but you can feel it with the tip of your foot. There's a little, a little toehold down there. And then if you get on that toehold, you drop your other foot down, and there's another toehold. And it just happens that a, a thousand years ago, somebody carved uh, just a series of toll holds down this, down this rock face. And you climb down those, and they lead to a ledge. And the ledge wraps around underneath here, and it drops down into another spot that you go through a saddle and around to the other side and through another saddle and down and around. It's this, it's this circuitous route that's constantly carrying you down deeper and deeper. And this is a... The, the landscape is just covered with these. I don't, really take, I don't take maps out there anymore, out into this place, because it's all memory. This place is the map. I went down with my wife, Reagan, and we went down a, 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 a fairly large cliff face, but one that had some good ledges on it, so the only reason to have rope is to lower your pack. But we... we didn't get all the way down before sunset, so we set a camp out on the face. And it's, it was the most spectacular camp I think I've ever had in my life. That's my spot. And it was just this narrow ledge. Um, I, I had a thermarest with me, and it wasn't as wide as the thermarest. So I had, to, I had to put a rock under my hip to keep from rolling, and Reagan slept right, right above me with her feet on my head. And nights like that, the dreams are so solid, so sound, you don't move once all night. Just to get our stuff out to that ledge, you, you couldn't actually go with a, a pack. You had to take your pack off because there, there's a, a drop. You kind of have to jump from left to right. So you, you, you come up against the wall, you put your foot around, and you do that. And then we unloaded our packs piece by piece and then handed each piece across so that when, then we could set our camp on the ledge. And in the morning, we continued down the face, lowering our packs until you get down to the next level. And the next level falls out from itself, the ground constantly opening up. You can, you can feel the wind and the water opening the earth as if there was no bottom to this, constantly finding the next route to take you from ledge to ledge to ledge, down through cracks and narrows, chimneys leading down step by step, until you get to this arch. It's a small arch. It's, it's only about this tall, so the photograph is a little... Well, size, scale, dimension, they all kind of leave out there. And right inside of this archway, there's a bunch of broken pottery. So you know this was, this was a, a used route a thousand years ago. 
and the arch leads down into a canyon that opens up. And you go up a side canyon into this little alcove where a piece of the ceiling has fall, fallen just slightly. And I found this place, the first time I found this was on the 27th day of a backpack. And I got up to this spot and I took my hat off and I stuck my head in the crack, which is something that I do frequently out there. Because I know every once in a while you're going to see something back inside of one of these cracks. And back in this crack, there was a basket about 1,500 years old that had been turned upside down so that it wouldn't collect anything. And it was way back down in the crack so that no, no light or wind would touch it. And it was in perfect condition. You could put it on your kitchen table. You could put apples in it. And as far as I know, it's still there, except for that piece which we went on this trip to collect a piece for radiocarbon dating. A, uh, a federal archaeologist in, in southern Utah had asked us to pick up one piece of it to bring out. So that part of the basket is missing. There are artifacts everywhere. They stand out. This, is, this arrowhead here is, is maybe just under half an inch long tiny little piece made out of jasper in some canyon, someplace. There are larger objects. There are cliff dwellings that you find up in the, up in the alcoves. This is, this is out on the Navajo Reservation in, in southern Utah. There, this is part of a structure that's, that's about, I'd say, 300 rooms running along the back side of, of this canyon, a little village small city, something, artifacts everywhere. One of the walls had fallen out, revealing the floor that had been packed in there. Hundreds of years of people using the same floor, just pushing down the dirt so that there were, there were pieces of woven, of braided string sticking out of, out of the floor everywhere, and, and, and arrowheads and broken pottery. And, and I realized when I came up against this, this stack of this trash pile, stratigraphy, I, just, I put my head against it and looked along it, and I could see it was covered with hair. The people in that room had been combing their hair for hundreds of years, and it had been landing on the floor. And then new floors are built on top of that, and new floors. And I just I ran my hand across, just barely across the front of this, and I could feel the hair of people who had been there. And I was there with a a Navajo guy that I know who just was creeped out by this because there's a certain heavy taboo in, in Navajo culture about death. And, and he said, after we, we left this cliff dwelling, he said, I need a ceremony. Too much death. You can't touch that much death, he said. But I'm from a different culture where we roll around in death where we fill museums with death. This, this uh, skull is a, from a, about a five-year-old. And I found it because I thought it was a gourd. I saw the back side of it, and it still had scalp on it. And I thought, oh, a whole gourd. And I reached down and picked it up and turned it around and had this face looking at me, which is a very odd thing. Maybe I need a ceremony. These routes that I am following have led me all over the place. Um, the, the one I'm about to tell you about didn't actually uh, occur in, in House of Rain. It, it, uh, House of Rain was getting too large, too many stories. But, but I, was, I was looking at how shells get traded. Uh, there, there are shell trade routes all over the Southwest. Shell was a, very, was a primary material for making jewelry, for, for using in burials. And, and you had to walk 600 miles to get it down to the Sea of Cortez, uh, the, the water that's in between Baja and the mainland of Mexico. And, and I, I tracked routes all the way down to the border over years, and then across the Mexican border into Sonora, and then across a place called the Pinacate into a, a dune field on the other side. 
uh, where it's 5,000 square miles of sand dunes, just a beautiful landscape, but no water out there, but pottery, broken pottery all over in certain places, and pieces of shell left behind where you could, you could see that the people were crossing these dunes to the sea and picking up shell and then crossing back and then moving it up to Phoenix, and then from Phoenix distributing it throughout the rest of the Southwest. The first trip I took out there, we, we hit this mountain range right at the edge of the dunes. And we were carrying, I don't know, on that trip we were maybe carrying 80 or nine pound, 90 pounds of water and, and moving it out into the sand. And then we'd drop a cache and go back and get more water and then move it out and drop a cache and, and then move that water out. And, we thought we'd, we, were, we were trying to get to the Sea of Cortez. That was one of the things on our minds. But this landscape, um, it, it just starts turning your mind inward or outward, or it gets hard to tell which way it turns it, because it's, it's a psychological place. There's no, there's no end to your horizons. The sky is, is infinite. The sand is infinite. It's hard to, to keep your focus because you're constantly using peripheral vision, looking all around you. It doesn't matter which way you walk after a while. You're just wandering. And so on the first trip out there, we didn't get to the sea because we just ended up wandering. It happens out there. You have a plan, but the landscape becomes beautiful in a way that you weren't expecting. And you start disappearing into it. You start forgetting why you were going in one direction. You start thinking, no, I just want to see that shadow over there and spend time in there. And then I want to see the next shadow and the next. It took three trips, actually, before, before I got to the sea. And all over at the edges of the dunes and sometimes even out in the middle of the dunes where you get into a, a deep hole, you'll find a broken ceramic olla. You'll find some sign of people which you know, out in, out in the, the deepest parts of the dunes where you find a seashell that somebody carried in there, and you're picking up the shell going, what were you doing out here? Why were you walking in this place? Were you seeing it in the same way that I'm seeing it? Were you floating through this place like a ghost, or were you trudging and swimming and dragging yourself? What were you doing out here? On the last trip out, we did a lot of night walking. And we, we uh, walk barefoot for the most part because it's much easier than, than walking in boots. And it's just nice to walk barefoot for, for days and days at a time. And on that trip in particular, there were a lot of sidewinders out in the dunes, which made for an interesting element because the previous trips, there, there had been snakes, but not, not so many. You'd wake up in the morning and there'd be these elegant sidewinder tracks everywhere. And the guy who dropped us off on that trip has a proclivity, it seems, for picking up dangerous animals. I don't recommend it. It was kind of a terrifying experience to have somebody pick up a rattlesnake and go, look at it, look at it, and just put it right in your face. And you're going, no, no, no thanks. Especially when he was the one who was driving away and leaving you out there to walk barefoot across the sand. Out there, where at times you're carrying 100 pounds of water, where you're carrying water in your hands, you're carrying water on your back. Everything is about water out there. You bury your water. You pick up your water. You strap it to your body. I remember on one of the trips, just carrying all this weight on my back. And, and, and not sure why I had all this weight on my back. It was making me so clumsy. It was dragging me around. And, and I started trying to unclip it and, and unbuckle all this stuff that I was carrying out in the dunes so I could get rid of it finally until I realized, wow, you really put a lot of buckles on this. You, you didn't want this stuff off of you. What, oh, it's water. Don't drop your water. Keep carrying it. Drink it. This landscape is all about water. And on this last trip, you can see the, the Sea of Cortez out there on the horizon. We walked to the edge of the dunes. And even out there, just past the edge of the dunes, you would find places where there's, there were piles of pottery, pottery scattered in the sand. And then the desert pan extended out. And then you reach the Sea of Cortez. 
that lies beyond. You know, I, I should, I want to show you guys these next slides. I'm kind of running out of time here, but I've got to show you this place. So I'm not going to go into heavy detail. I just want to take you down here into the Sierra Madre. One of these routes, I, I, I was following routes all over the place for House of Rain, trying to figure out where the Anasazi went, went when they left the Four Corners. Many of them ended up in making the modern pueblos of, of uh, Hopi, Tiwa, Acoma in New Mexico and Arizona, but still other groups continued south. And I followed trails, architectural pottery trails down into the Sierra Madre, where we, uh, my wife and I and, and two others were out in the backcountry for, for a month, and we, we finally came to these canyons that were just packed with cliff dwellings. Many of them were multi-story cliff dwellings. It seemed like Every single cave we looked into had cliff dwellings. And this wasn't a place with trails. This wasn't a known location. Was, many of these sites were, were pristine. They, they were just, it, it looked as if people had, had just left, just suddenly, just like all the stories you hear. Little cliff dwellings, little granaries, little sites falling apart. Larger sites. This site went actually five rooms deep back into this cave. And it, this very, very particular to this region were these, these shaped storage rooms. This one is about a, a 10 feet high. Often they would have door stones sealing them on the top. And, and they were of all kinds of shapes and sizes, but very specific to that area. That's the smallest one we found. And then uh, this is the largest one, about 15 feet tall. Now, where these have fallen over, they've broken open. And you can see that they were just full of, full of material. There's a, there's a woven mat right up there that's fallen out of that one. This, this, these sites were just covered with uh, you know, corn cobs, where we'd go in and find a, a cache of corn cobs about four feet deep and 12 feet long, thousands upon thousands of corn cobs, and woven material all over the place. Pieces of, of basketry, pieces of their sandals. This, this place is, is very well preserved. I mean, a lot of this stuff is obviously worn, but it's been sitting there for 500 years. And what I found there that was very specific to, to Anasazi were T-shaped doorways. Um, you can see a, a large T-shape here. This is a very specific symbol that, that you see in Chaco Canyon and you see in Mesa Verde. It's, it's a, by the, there are certain sites that have been excavated down in, in Chihuahua where, where they're finding T-shaped altars where, where pieces of stone about this size have been cut into T's and are standing up inside of rooms just covered with, with objects, with necklaces. And, and so, so the shape obviously had some meaning. But it, it, is, it is a clear Anasazi shape. It is a clear shape from the Colorado Plateau. You do see it in, in Palenque. You see it in, in certain Incan sites in South America. So it might be a, a Pan-American feature. I'm not sure what it is. Some Hopi people have told me that the T, the bottom of the T, goes down into a mythical underground lake, that this is an upside down mountain that leads down into a place called the House of Rain. That is, is where Tlaloc, probably the oldest American uh, deity, a rain deity, lives down in the House of Rain. And this is a T-shape from, from up on the Colorado Plateau. And that is the last picture on these slides. So I, I, the T-shape, the, the pottery, there were, I followed genetic information that you, you find in bones and teeth. I, I followed as many different pieces of information as I could, and they sent me walking. I started in Chaco Canyon and walked north, up to Mesa Verde, around to Comb Ridge in Utah, down into the Hopi Mesas and through Kayenta, across the Mogollon Rim, down 
into the low country below the Mogollon Rim to Mexico and then into the Sierra Madre, following people, following routes. Because everything in the desert leaves a route that leaves you, leads you somewhere. Everything out there is a story. And that's what I'm following, these stories. Looking for ways, looking for sand, grains of sand out of place looking for stories out in the middle of nowhere. I can open this up for questions, if anybody has any questions. I was wondering if they had any sort of metal, or whether they, did they use hardened rocks of some sort to shape their stones? Um, most, most of what they did was, was stone. Um, metallurgy was just starting to move up into um, into northern Chihuahua at that time, and they were working with copper, and and that was that was Soft. just just uh, ornamental. So there was there was no metal going on at all, other than imported bells or. or and the shell, the shell they went down to the Cortez Lake, not like the Cortez Sea to get that was probably was that hard or was that mostly brittle? It was hard, but not not tool hard. Not tool you, hard. You could, the Colorado Plateau is covered with. Uh, with chert, um, a, a glassy rock that is really, really good for making, making tools, making very sharp edges. You, f you find there are pieces of cut chert all over the place, and you can still cut your skin open very quickly with it, and it's been sitting out in the open for... Where, do, where does chert come from? Chert is, is it's a marine rock that, it's mostly silica, okay. that's, that's all... Compressed. You find it in these layers, sandstone layers, and they'll, if you're in a, especially in a marine or a water environment, you'll find this layer of chert, and and the you know it's in all colors: purple, green, red, blue. It's it's a beautiful rock. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you: uh, uh, the review in the paper recently on Sunday said that your book is different from all the other books about the Anasazi because you uh, brought out some of the um, non-flattering parts of their culture, like yeah. violence. How, do you, how did you conclude that they were a violent culture? Well, I didn't, act, I didn't necessarily conclude they were a violent culture. I just concluded there was violence in their culture. Um, the, the evidence is very, very clear where you find massacre sites, where every place that you drop a trench their bodies, all over, unburied bodies, with you know, missing their heads. In some cases, where uh, there'll be a head in one room and you can match it up to the body, which is in another room 100 yards away. And they didn't just end up there. Somebody took the head off. And there'll be places where it's all femurs, all gathered together. And, and places where it's obviously some kind of warfare event, where where people are all huddled in, into one spot and they've all been burned there. They're, they're, the record is very clear of some intense violence and it comes up at a very certain points in time. It comes up in the 10th century, right before large migrations. You see this, this layer of violence and it doesn't cover everything. Um, and sometimes a series of Pueblos will all be destroyed over here and then a series of Pueblos over here are in perfect condition as far as you know, the walls aren't broken down, the, there aren't bodies all over the place. It looks like the place was left very peacefully or ceremoniously where, where you can see that they, they've set artifacts out and, and left the place. So different people had different ends, but you can definitely see where people had some extremely unfortunate ends. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the, the details. They're, they're written in the book, but, but some fairly grisly evidence. And, and it, it dates all the way back to, you know, into the early Anasazi, into basket maker times. And you can, you can see these pockets of violence. And what that tells me is that these were human beings. You know, I, there's so much of this, oh, the Anasazi were these beautiful, wise, balanced with the earth people and it's like no they were us living there doing their neolithic stone age thing but still us still human beings living in a place chopping each other into little pieces at some times and living lives of, of 
prosperity at other times. We have time for one more question. Uh, yeah. There was a uh, global warming uh, when there were uh, dairy farms in Greenland and a cathedral there. And I know, the, the, I believe the Maya moved from the lowlands to the highlands. Yeah. And the, the Anasazi came down to the Salt River and... Uh, yeah, yeah, there were, a lot of the movement was, was based on climate. The Anasazi were always moving. I mean, that's the, the whole thing about the disappeared Anasazi. Well, there were, they were always disappearing. You go to where they're living and then they disappear all of a sudden, but you follow them and find, oh, 10 years later they're over here, and 70 years later they're over here, and it's, they're, they're often being driven by these, these climate changes, which on the Colorado Plateau, very small changes make you go. If you, if you lose one inch of precipitation in one year, you gotta, you gotta get up to the mesas where there's a little bit more rain, and then when the frost comes in too early, you gotta get down to the desert. So around 1276 or so, um, the water was running out, the, the seasons were, were no good, and I think they just looked at their trade routes and said, let's follow these and go south. I mean, we're always getting pushed around by, by the environment. Okay, thank you, Craig, so much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for coming. And we are, Craig's happy to take some more informal questions in back, and of course his book, House of Rain, is available for sale in back too. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Craig Charles, for coming. <laughs>